People say that one of the most romantic things you can do is sit on a beach at sunset and watch the sun drop below the watery horizon in a blaze of colour. I am sitting on a beach now. I can feel the contours of the sand shift beneath me as I move. I can lift up handfuls of sand and let them trickle through my hands. I can smell the water of the Sea of Galilee stretching out to the horizon in front of me and feel the gentle breeze cool my face after the heat of the day has passed. But I am numb to the core of my being because today we have buried my mother. She wasn't young, of course, but she was only ill for a few days and then she was gone. People from nearby villages who knew her and even those from places further afield like Tiberias must have known that her end was near because her funeral was the biggest ever seen in Magdala Nanaya, the place of the Tower of the Fishes. With the heat around us, we have to bury our dead within 24 hours, so some people must have walked all night once the news spread that she had died. Some of the leaders of the new Christian community came to help our Rabbi Mark say Kadesh and eulogize her. I know that she was my mother, but the words which were spoken about her were quite extraordinary. My mother has always been a storyteller. When we were children, she would make up such wonderful stories as we sat around the table after the evening meal. We would plead with her to tell us the stories from the Talmud, but our favourite was her version of the Passover story. Traditionally, it is the oldest man present at the Passover meal who, when asked to tell the story, by the youngest child present, would teach the family about the exile of our ancestors in Egypt and how we escaped the clutches of Pharaoh. In our house, Dad would start the story, then look at Mother, and she would carry on. We could feel the drudgery of making the bricks from clay in the hot Egyptian sun. She could make us see the blood of the slaughtered lamb running down the posts of the doorway to tell the angel of death to pass over. We could smell the fear of the exiles as they reached the shores of the Red Sea and realised that Pharaoh's army was catching them up. We joined in the relief and joy of our ancestors as the last one of them stepped on the dry, safe land and the waters came crashing down on the men, horses and chariots of Egypt, killing them all. And the prayers of thanksgiving we said with our Passover meal were all the more heartfelt for her storytelling. Mother's favourite story, though, was one that she was actually involved in. After Dad died, I think she became rather lonely. Not that there weren't plenty of people around her. The problem was that they were not Dad. It was as if she had lost part of herself. Then Rabbi Jesus came to Magdala Nanaya and sat down beneath a tree in the marketplace and told stories. Stories of Yahweh the like of which we had never heard before. Mother fell in love all over again with the stories, with Yahweh and with Rabbi Jesus. It was as if in him and in his stories and teaching, she found the right shaped piece to knit her broken soul back together again. When he moved on from Magdala, Mother just left with him joining the band of women followers who helped to look after the rabbi and his friends. My eldest brother was both worried and ashamed when she went and set off to find her and bring her back. He found her, but he did not bring her back. He never really explained what had happened, but I know that he spoke to Rabbi Jesus and that he must have persuaded my mother would be safe with him. We heard stories, of course, about what Rabbi Jesus was preaching and saying. And we were with family in Jerusalem the fateful year that the Roman authorities arrested, tried and crucified him. Mother told us so often the story of what happened on the third day after Rabbi Jesus' death that I could almost tell it as well as she. Early in the morning, just as the sun was rising, Mother, with a group of women followers, set out from Jerusalem to the place where the body of the rabbi had been hastily stored as the Sabbath was beginning. The day promised to be warm and sunny, 
but the sun was not yet hot enough to burn the dew off the plants beside the road. When Mother told the story, she would describe hearing the birds of the dawn chorus singing in the trees and would tell her audience that on the walk she got unreasonably angry with them for singing when her Rabboni was dead. A wry smile would always come over her face at this admission and she would go on to say that the birds must have got to the tomb first and were rejoicing at what had happened, but she had yet to find out. When the group got to the tomb, It appeared that the problem of how they were going to remove the stone from the entrance to the tomb was solved, for it was already open. A second look told them that the soldiers who were guarding the entrance were slumped down, one on either side of the tomb entrance. The women thought that they must have been attacked, but when they looked closely, they could see no blood. Then one of the men made a loud, snorting snore, and the women relaxed, thinking that they were just in a drunken stupor. They became panic-stricken when Mother entered the tomb with several of the other women following her, and all they saw in it were the cloths, which had been hastily wrapped around the body, and they were lying on the shelf where Rabbi Jesus' body had been placed, and the headcloth was lying beside it on the floor. The other women ran screaming from the tomb, shouting that the Roman robbers had been and stolen the body of Rabbi Jesus. It must be the Romans. Mother didn't run. She sat down and buried her face in her hands. In the silence, she became aware of the smells of the place, not the rotting putrefaction of a body that had been lying there for three days. There was the smell of the rock, newly cut to make the tomb, and the dust that was thrown up everywhere in the heat of summer. There was the faint smell of some unidentified flower, fragrant and subtle. With her head bowed, she put her hands down on either side of her, feeling the grooves in the rock shelf made by the chisels which had hacked the tomb from the hillside. She became aware that the light in the tomb was getting brighter. In confusion, she looked up and saw, standing to one side, lounging against the wall, an angel. When we asked her what an angel looked like, she would always tell us that she didn't know. She just knew that he was an angel. But he was form and light. He was substance, yet insubstantial. He was fearsome and gentle. But above all, he was the most wonderful smell and the most pure sound. When he spoke, she said that he could have listened to him for hours. He asked her what she was doing looking for the living among the dead. Didn't she know that Jesus had risen from the dead as he had told his followers he would? Mother always said at this point that she was unfounded. Rabbi Jesus had told them what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. It wasn't that they didn't believe him. It's just that they didn't know what to expect. When the angel finished speaking, he stopped existing in the tomb, leaving just a memory of his smell and an echo of his voice that lingered. Mother was so overcome and so confused still about what was happening that she left the tomb and went to sit on a bank nearby. Hearing steps on the stony path, she turned and thinking it was the gardener, asked him where the body of Rabbi Jesus had been taken. No matter how many times she told the story, she would always put this bit in about how stupid she had been at the time not to understand either the rabbi or the angel she had just seen. So she asked the figure where the body of the rabbi had been taken. Then the figure spoke, simply calling her by name. She knew instantaneously that he was him, and she got up and began to run towards him, calling him Rabboni, Master, meaning to throw her arms around him. But the rabbi stilled her and stepped back, and told her that she could not touch him yet. He then asked her to go back to the rest of his followers and tell them that she had seen him and get them to leave Jerusalem and go to Galilee where he would meet them again. Mother was most reluctant to go as she had lots of questions to ask and she was afraid he would disappear again without answering them. But he seemed to sense her need and he told her that they would meet again and that he would answer all her questions. Mother's life from then on was one full of meaning and purpose. 
After first telling the apostles what she had seen, she told the story to anyone who would listen. She would talk to the crowds, telling them the stories that the rabbi had told her. Her role as the first person to meet with the newly resurrected Jesus gave her a standing among the apostles, the apostle to the apostles, the messenger to the messengers of Yahweh, those Rabbi Jesus had chosen to be the main carrier of his message to his people. As she grew older and less able to travel, people began to come to her here in Magdala, and she would always have a welcome for them and a story, and she would share the bread and wine as Rabbi Jesus had done at his last meal before his crucifixion, as they had been commanded by him to do. Every child says that they will not forget their mother for good or ill. I will never be able to forget my mother because the story she has told of our ancestors, of Rabbi Jesus, will continue to be told for generations to come, starting with me and my daughter. <laughs>